Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Madan Muswati from the Research and Software Engineering Group, and it gives me utmost pleasure to introduce uh, Jin Liang back to Microsoft Research. Um, he was our intern a couple of years ago, working in Paracel on trying to build the first version of distributed ML training. Um, so Jin Liang uh, is a PhD student at CMU working with Eric Sheng and uh, Garth Gibson. Um, he's an expert on um, large-scale ML systems, and that's what his PhD, um, that's what he's been working during his PhD. Um, some of the initial work on Parameter Server um, led to, like, you know, was actually, he contributed to ideas that actually uh, eventually became a startup called Petum. Um, the, the startup uh, done by his advisor. Um, and then um, actually he's moved on to do like a lot of cool things on dynamic scheduling of the uh, of large scale models. That's that's what he'll be talking about today. So Jin Liang. Right. Sure. Right. Uh, thank you, Madame, for the introduction. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, I, I did an internship here two years ago and had a really good time. Now I want to come back and work here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so uh, so I'm really glad I had the opportunity to speak to you guys, and thank you all very much for coming. So the title of my talk is Scheduling for Efficient Large-Scale Machine Learning Training. Uh, so as you all know, so scheduling is a classic research topic in computer systems, but because the workload is special, uh, important machine learning training, there are many new opportunities that can, we can leverage uh, in scheduling to uh, improve the efficiency of this machine learning computation. Uh, so as you probably already observed, like over the past couple of years, machine learning has achieved wide success in many application domains. So machine learning is basically a set of techniques to extract knowledge or insights from big data sets. So the extracted insights are summarized as a set of mathematical equations, which we refer to as the machine model. So machine training is basically to find parameters of those mathematical equations that fit your observations of, about the problem. So even since the early days of, of machine learning, training has be, always been a hard problem because it's highly computational heavy. And even today, when people continue to pipe machine learning to new domains and extend, uh, improve performance of, of existing problems, we are collecting bigger and bigger data sets and we're designing more and more complex machine learning models. Because of this, the computational challenge for, for machine learning training is becoming heavier and heavier. So not only machine learning training takes a long time, because machine, machine learning problem models have a lot of parameters and generate a lot of intermediate results, they also consume large memory. And lastly, you know, even though like, distribu distributed computation and parallel computing can help improve training time, implementing a parallel distributed program is hard for many machine learning researchers and practitioners. Motivated by this challenge, I have devoted my PhD research to improve the efficiency of machine learning training by developing practical machine learning training systems that are easy to use for machine learning researchers and programmers. So the key idea behind uh, my research is to leverage the structural properties of machine learning computation to improve the efficiency of, uh, of the application. So there are a couple of challenges faced uh, by this approach. So first of all, what kind of structural properties can we leverage to improve the efficiency of machine learning computation? And second, how generalizable are those, uh, are those properties? Can they be generalized across different models and different machine algorithms? And lastly, how can we leverage those information without heavily burdening the application user? Um, by solving these challenges, I have developed two different systems uh, for, uh, for machine learning training, which I'll talk to you uh, today. Also worked on quite a bit on TensorFlow to improve its memory efficiency during training. So before I go into details about my projects, I want to clarify that the scheduling I'm talking about is scheduling within a single training job. So basically, when you get uh, a set of, uh, so when you get uh, a hardware resource, and you, when, you, uh, when you have a training job, how do you make efficient use of this hardware resource to improve the efficiency of a training computation? This, in contrast to cluster scheduling, where you have a bunch of jobs, and you want to, improve, you want to maximize the throughput of your computer cluster. Uh, so when we think about compute cluster, I think there are three most precious hardware resources. One is your network bandwidth, second parallel computation, and lastly is your memory. So I have done projects to explore uh, making better use of all three of them uh, to, uh, to both improve uh, training time and to enable training larger models without using important hardware. 
So this will be what I'll be telling you today. Uh, that's the uh, three projects. So despite that there, there are many different machine models and different learning algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms typically um, take the, this common form. First, you're gonna take many passes over your training data. And second, uh, within each training pass, you're gonna process your training data in mini batches. And within mini batch, you're gonna produce uh, some updates to improve your model quality. So basically, over time, you're gonna observe your model quality gradually improves when you, uh, when you compute up mini batch updates to update your model parameters. And your training stops when your model quality uh, stops changing or when it becomes sat satisfactory. So this is what we call convergence. So this, uh, the iterative convergence nature of machine learning training is what distinguishes machine learning training from classic computer programs uh, because machine learning training is basically a search process. So you can think of uh, there's, uh, there's object function that you want to minimize or maximize by finding a good set of model parameters. And you can think of this object function as, uh, as, a, as a surface or multi-dimensional space. And when you, when you process many batches uh, to produce updates, you are taking small steps um, to move your weights along this multi-dimensional uh, surface. And this training process stops when, when this little ball is close enough to the minimum. So, uh, intuitively, by looking at this process, you will find that if there's some error during the computation, it does not kill your process. It does not mean your computation is run. Because as long as the error is properly bonded, you, really, you can compensate for this error by taking a couple more steps. So this makes a unique trade-off during machine learning training to trade uh, computation quality for computation throughput. So basically, the tr speed of your training algorithm depends on two factors. One is how fast you can take each step, which is your training, uh, which is which is your computer throughput. And second is how good each step is, which is uh, which is uh, the, the quality of the computation. So a lot of training systems make a trade-off between the two to improve their computer throughput. So one of the uh, one of the more important uh, benefit of this trade-off is that it enables an efficient way. Uh, to parallelize your machine algorithm, or a very simple way to parallelize your machine algorithm, which is referred to as data parallelism. Uh, in data parallelism, what you do is simply run many or all of your mini batches in parallel on the workers. So in the most basic form of data parallelism, each worker is going to per process the mini batch of data, produce some updates, and all the workers are going to then all the workers synchronize uh, to upload their primary updates to a set of servers, which we call primary server, then pull the new set of uh, primary, uh, primary uh, states to, be, to begin the next mid batch computation. As you can see, during this process, we can greatly improve the computing throughput by processing mini batches in parallel. However, this has a negative effect on your computation quality. So the reason that this has a negative effect on your computation quality is that the data parallelism does not retain the sequential semantics of your training computation. So in, in sequential training, you're processing your mini batches in, uh, sequentially so that later mini batches can all observe the updates produced from earlier mini batches. However, when you process mini batches in parallel in the data parallel form, the mini batches that are processed in parallel will not be able to observe uh, updates from all other parallel workers until a synchronization barrier. So what this means is that the results produced by this parallel process will be different from the result you get from the sequential execution. Let's suppose you start your training uh, state as, uh, suppose your uh, model parameter, so your weights, starts as uh, uh, dot w0. After you process the first mini batch, you're gonna produce some updates called delta w1. And by applying delta w1 to w0, you get, um, you get the first um, model parameter states w1. And then you sequentially process the next mini batch, you get um, parameter state w2. However, if you process the second mini batch in parallel with W0, you're gonna get a different set of uh, W2 compared to um, the sequential computation. And if you directly apply this theta delta W2 to W1, you're gonna get a slightly different, uh, you're gonna get a slightly different um, primary states compared to sequential execution. So this is why data parallelism does not give you the same result as the sequential computation. So even though there's some difference, Usually, you can compensate for this difference by taking some more steps. Uh, so that's why uh, data parallelism, um, even though it does not give you the exact result at sequential computation, is still worth doing because you can greatly improve your computation throughput. 
However, in order to implement efficient data parallel system, there's one problem that we cannot overlook, which is the communication bottleneck. So the models that we were interested in earlier, they have this um, property that computation per minute batch is pretty light. However, because models have many parameters, when you communicate updates uh, for each, after each minute batch computation, you're going to have a big communication uh, overhead. So basically, as you can see here, basically if you communicate parameter updates after single, each single minute batch computation, you spend a lot of time on communication. The opportunity we observe here is that the parameter updates are element-wise uh, additions. So what this means is that for, from each mini batch, we click, uh, we get a bunch of updates for each individual parameters, and we have the opportunity to coalesce updates from different mini batches uh, to reduce the volume of the computation. So this this gives us uh, the idea uh, to do. Uh, to uh, to do local buffering, which basically says we can communicate after processing and mini batches to allow us to coalesce updates to reduce, to reduce the communication volume. And secondly, this gives the idea of bonded slowness, such that instead of, direct, instead of waiting for communication to finish, we can go into uh, computing the next set of mini batches uh, while communication is still in place. This allows us to overlap communication with the computation to further reduce the communication overhead. Also allow, additionally allow us uh, to tolerate transient strugglers. So as you can see, uh, with those approaches, we can improve computation throughput. That's what people commonly do. However, they pay a big, uh, big price uh, for the computation uh, consistency. Uh, so the, the problem that I'm interested in is whether or not we can, uh, whether or not we can better leverage the hardware resource to still get the, from the computing throughput from parallelization without, paying so, without, without getting so much inconsistency in parameter states. So next I'm going to talk about two projects, uh, about scheduling network communication and scheduling computation to improve uh, the parameter uh, consistency during parallel computation. So uh, one of the opportunity we observe is that when we do data parallel computation, during communication events, there, the network could be idle. So one of the straightforward ideas that people use is they can tune the communication frequency to simply communicate more frequent, simply communicate all parameter updates more frequently to improve the freshness or improve the consistency of the parameter states. However, this is not an optimal approach. If you think about when you communicate all the updates uh, as one big message, you basically put those updates into a network queue. And those updates cannot be modified um, uh, when they're in the network queue. However, when those updates are being in communication, you might be finishing new mini batches and producing new, uh, new updates. Those updates ideally could be coalesced with updates in transit to, uh, uh, to update your, uh, to give you higher value from this, uh, the same amount of network bandwidth. So with, thi with this insight, the idea uh, of my work was pretty straightforward. We're gonna do fine grained communication. So basically we're still gonna do uh, periodic synchronization, but when we never we see alternately, we never we see spare network bandwidth. We're gonna do uh, fine grained communication to utilize the spare network bandwidth to improve the consistency in parameter states. So now, because we are doing fine grained communication, we're not going to communicate all the parameter updates in one setting. Uh, so this comes the question of what parameter updates that we need to communicate when we do this kind of uh, optimistic communication. So one signal we find to be useful is to communicate parameter updates based on their relative magnitude. So basically, we're going to look at uh, the relative, relative magnitude of parameter updates relative, relative to parameter values and prioritize, communica uh, prioritize communicating those updates that have a larger relative magnitude. So now I'm going to show you some experiment results to, uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of this idea. So our baseline is basically we are synchronizing the uh, model parameters every end time. So basically, this, uh, uh, sorry, this is a parameter system that I developed called Boson that runs on 16, uh, uh, 16 CPU machines. The application here is topic modeling. So the baseline here is basically we are going to synchronize all the parameter, model parameters end times uh, during one local data pass. So the, the most basic form is we're going to synchronize after we process all the local data once, so we're gonna synchronize once after we process all the local data. 
So as you can see, this, this takes a long time to converge uh, to, a, to a good model quality. So basically, on the, on the, on the y-axis, I'm showing you the time for, the, for this model to converge to a satisfactory quality. Yes? This is uh, this is a model called latent rich leaf all allocation. So this is used for talking about like clustering documents. So the algorithm I use here is a sampling algorithm. It's not SGD, but the, the, the idea applied to SGD as well. So I, I, I purposely want to show like this works for not only SGD but also something, you know, like broad machine algorithms. So and this works for sparse parts. Yeah, this uh, works for sparse. So so this uh, so. Uh, this works for sparse models. Uh, this also works, uh, I, you know, the, the, because the you know the early days the models we interested in are more like more sparse access models. Uh, but like uh, we're also seeing this today. Uh, this also works on dense models like neural networks. Basically, people prioritize communication of larger updates. Uh, like when you train data pilot training neural networks across data center, like when you bandwidth is highly limited. They, they use uh, part this partition idea as a compression idea. Basically, there's a recent paper called Deep Gradient Compression. Basically, they say instead of committing updates for all the parameters, we only commit updates for like top K, like 1% or maybe like 0.1% of parameters. And ah, so the top for 1% is based on the magnitude? Yeah, basically relative magnitude of, uh, of the, uh, the data changes. So is it reasonable to assume like some layers converge faster than the other layers? And because of that, you can apply such an optimization like you can? Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely true. Uh, you, uh, so it's, so it's basically you can even observe that not only layers, but like some parameters uh, converge faster than others. Basically, like over time, you'll see some parameters stops changing like pretty early on, but some parameter uh, like takes a long time. Okay, so okay. if, like, let's say one of the layers converges really quickly, yeah. why do I even bother sending an update or update? Freeze it, you know, freeze that layer for, for the rest of the training so that... Yeah, so that, that, would, be, that would be idea, right? That, so yeah, that, that's the idea, but like, how do you, how do you decide uh, a uh, stop, complete stop changing, right? right? There, uh, so basically, uh, you, you determine that by comparing that, the changes in that layer with other layers. Okay, got so it. that would communicate. Okay. Uh, so basically, like when you increase the communication frequency here, uh, you're going to see the convergence speed is improved, and uh, you're going to see uh, basically beyond like asynchronization per data pass, you're going to see you're not going to see any improvements in your convergence rate. And now I'm going to show you like with fine gradient communication, uh, what what kind of convergence rate we can achieve. So basically, with fine gradient communication, we're going to give each worker node a bandwidth budget, and the worker node is going to perform one synchronization per data pass, but it's going to optimally communicate updates uh, whenever it see bandwidth uh, is spare. So, when, for example, when we have 300 megabits per second, we can communicate, uh, we can achieve a faster convergence rate compared to synchronize once uh, per data pass. And we give it uh, a higher bandwidth budget, we converge even faster. What I want to show you here is that even though the convergence time um, comparing to you know, synchronize all parameters and uh, fine gradient communication is similar. However, we, we communicate uh, less, less bytes per data pass to achieve the same effect because, uh, because, um, because we do fine gradient communication, each byte we send carries potentially more information. So far, I'm showing you the prioritization is based on randomly picking updates to send. If we pick updates by the, based on their relative magnitude, we can see even faster convergence under the same monthly budget. Right? So basically, on, we, even when we use only 300 megabits per second, we can achieve uh, roughly the same convergence rate as previously that used 640 megabits per second. And we converge, and we give it a higher bandwidth budget with relative magnitude prioritization, we converge even faster. So this, this is basically about, yes? How did you understand? You have a distributed system. Right. How do you decide consensus on at any point in time which which parameters to actually you want to do an all reduce on, for instance? You want to synchronize on. So this uh, so this is the parameter server model, right? So basically the Got it. okay right. the question goes away. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so so far I have talked yes. So also you're assuming like one gigantic bandwidth between the parameter servers and the workers, right? So, like, a network is more complicated. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. 
So you, like, how much does that contribute to complication of the? So, so right now, like, you know, so, so the, the scheme I was talking about is like basically you give each node a bandwidth budget that says like this node can use this much bandwidth. Mm -hmm. the, the network is complicated uh, because, so say like the, the, uh, the machine you have, for example, has one gigabit Ethernet card, but the network does not give you end-to-end -end bandwidth of right. one gigabit per second. Yeah. So I, I agree with you that like finding the, the bandwidth budget of each node is a hard problem. Right. Uh, so I don't have a really good solution for that. Uh, so it kind of depends on the architecture. So what uh, does the bandwidth budget here look like on the parameter server side of things? Is this a sharded parameter server? Or is so, so the architecture of the system uh, is uh, you know, with that basically the, the server nodes uh, and the, the, uh, sorry, the server process and the, the work process are located on the same server, on the same, same physical machine. So basically this bandwidth budget would be shared by the server process and mm -hmm. the, the work process. Uh, for the, the bandwidth number that you're showing here is limiting the worker? It's or is limiting both. Up? Basically, the server plus worker, they do not, exit, uh, uh, they do not use more than 640 megabits per second. Um, okay. Right. So the, on the server side, this is limiting the uh, computation of fresh parameter values. Um, so far, I have talked about scheduling network uh, communication uh, to improve the consistency in model parameters. Um, I, now, like, uh, I want to talk about scheduling computation to improve the consistency in parameter values. So the problem that we, um, so I want to, before I talking about this, I want to take a, a, simple, uh, a, a step back to look, look at how we parallelize the computation. In data parallelism, when we parallel the computation, we simply take a you know, rambling subset of mini batches and run them in parallel. You know, can we think of a better way to parallelize the computation such that parallel, the parallelism would actually preserve the synchronous semantic uh, uh, of the sequential algorithm. So one opportunity we observe is that uh, in some machine models, um, the parameters are sparsely accessed, which means when you process a mini batch data or when you process a data sample, it does not access all the model parameters. This gives you the opportunity to find, um, to find data samples that do not access the same parameter and run them in parallel. So in, for some models, this, for some models, this is, um, uh, for some models, uh, this property is easier to leverage because in some models, the parameters are accessed based on some data, data attribute field, or data, data sample attributes. Here I'm showing you application which we refer to uh, called matrix parameterization. Uh, this is something like, com this model is commonly used like in recommendation systems. So here, like the data sample are basically user ratings to items. Basically, each data record contains the user ID, a time ID, and the rating that is a rating that user gives to the item. The parameters that we want to learn are basically latent vectors for the users and for the items. When we use SGD to learn those parameters, we find, um, when we use SGD to learn those parameters, uh, the parameter access pattern for the vectors, basically for each data record, it access a user vector based on user ID and item vector based on item ID. So basically, the, uh, for each data record, the parameter is accessed depends on the data, data sample value, data attribute values for these two attributes. More formally, we state that this is a property such that there exists key fields uh, in your data attributes. Whenever two data samples are different in all these key attributes, they will not access the same parameters. If application, um, if we find this property holds true for application, this gives an easy way to partition the training data uh, to find parallel computation that does not incur conflicting parameter accesses. This, uh, this property is true for, uh, for metropolization, also true for topic modeling, gradient position trees, and so on, other applications. So when we find this property holds true for those applications, for example, in metropolization, this allows us to partition the data set by those fields uh, to eliminate conflicting parameter accesses. For example, for the metric application, for the matrix parallelization application, um, we can organize the train data into a 2D matrix use, with user IDs and all-time IDs uh, as a matrix uh, indices. And we can partition this matrix along these two dimensions such that different partitions do not access the same parameters. For example, here, um, the, the blocks uh, of the same color will not access the same um, parameters when they're processing, uh, will not access the same parameters. So, this, basically, this gives us a way to parallelize the training algorithm um, without, without, sacri uh, without sacrificing 
the, the sequential semantic. So this, this is actually a special case of automatic, automatic partisan compilers. Uh, so uh, this is actually a special case of automatic partisan compilers. However, uh, to actually leverage um, this property in computation, there are some challenges. The first challenge is that those properties are only applicable, applicable to some models, not all the models. So if user wants to use this, user will have to look at their training algorithm, decide whether or not this property holds true. And if it not hold true, we can fall back to the parallelism, but there's, um, there's a challenge for user to decide what kind of parallelization he wants to do. And second, even when this property holds true, uh, implementing um, a, a distributed computation using this kind of parallelization would not be trivial uh, because user would need to figure out the, the computation dependence pattern, uh, figure out how to partition your data set, and figure out, for example, how to coordinate the workers to efficiently compute uh, with the schedule because you, you need some kind of scheduling to assign parallel work uh, to your parallel workers. Uh, based on uh, facing those challenges, uh, it inspires me to design automatic parallelization system that will automatically look at your training, ideally automatically look at your training program and based on memory access pattern, <coughs> how the access, how the bin batch computation access all the parameters to decide how to parallelize the training uh, algorithm. So basically the system I, uh, I designed and implemented is called Orion. So basically Orion provides abstraction of your distributed cluster as basically a single thread and a huge memory. So basically from application programmer's point of view, it's only seeing a single thread with huge memory. Uh, so the, the big memory, the distributed memory, is abstracted away. As, as it's abstracted as a multiple dim, uh, as multi-dimensional arrays. So, uh, for example, you can use this multi-dimensional array to store more the parameters and store your data sets. Those, uh, those uh, multi-dimensional arrays will be automatically partitioned by the system based on your computation characteristics. And the system additionally provides a parallel four, which allow user to parallel a single uh, serial training for loop across the distributed cluster uh, machines. And the parallelization will preserve the sequential semantics when possible, and otherwise will fall back to the parallelism when user gives you the permission. So now I'm going to show you some experiment results comparing, uh, comparing Orion with other systems. One comparison I'm showing is uh, with comparing with Boson, which is the, uh, the system that I showed before. So Boson is using scheduled communication to improve, uh, to improve uh, the convergence rate for this same application, which is topic modeling, uh, latent duration allocation. So here on the x axis is time, on the y axis is log likelihood, which basically for this application, we want to maximize the training log likelihood to get a good model. So when we, when we use Orion, we can see Orion gives you a faster convergence on this application. And even though the, 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 uh, the speed is not that much different, but it's, it's still like we get. Uh, we get improvement uh, in convergence rate. What's most significant is about network bandwidth use. Uh, so in Boston, in order to achieve that kind of convergence rate, you have to excessive network communication. So the grid curve is how much network bandwidth you use uh, during, during the, the, the training process. As you can see, Boston is roughly using near about 1,500 uh, megabit, uh, 1, megabits per second, but Orion is using you know, five times less than that in average. Also, in order to implement the, the Boson uh, manually pilot, manual data parallelism, you have to implement like thousands of lines of C++ pro program. However, in Orion, you only need to implement a few hundred lines of Julia, which is a scripting language, provides you nice uh, syntax like Python. So I also have a comparison. I'm also showing a comparison between Orion and TensorFlow. This is the SGD algorithm for matrix variation. So uh, here, uh, we're showing convergence over time. And the, uh, the y-axis is uh, the, the training loss. So as you can see, TensorFlow converges completely much slower compared to Orion implementation. This is running on a single machine with 32 uh, C virtual CPUs. So TensorFlow runs slower for two reasons. One is that TensorFlow is not highly optimized for sparse computation uh, like materialization has. So basically, each data pass, TensorFlow takes about twice as much time as Orion. And second, because TensorFlow is using data parallelism, parallelism computation, uh, TensorFlow suffers uh, a slower convergence rate compared to Orion. So, so far, I have talked about two projects where uh, I schedule network communication and computation to improve the consistency in parameter states. Uh, so, we, so far, we have focused on 
improving communication across many, com improving computation across many batches. However, um, there's a trend in machine learning that the mini batch computation is becoming co more and more complex. One of the good, a good example of this is deep neural networks. Whereas deep neural networks has a bunch of different characteristics compared to the models that we interested in, uh, in, early, in the early days. In deep neural networks, we see much heavier computation per mini batch, and there's a dense parameter access from mini batch because you typically access all the parameters. And lastly, because these two properties, when we parallelize deep neural network using their parallel them, people typically do synchronization once per mini batch. However, because the complex uh, or the complex computation per mini batch, this gives us more opportunity to schedule within a single mini batch to improve the efficiency of deep neural networks. So basically, a deep neural network you can think of it as a cascade of functions. So each function has its own set of parameters and, and takes in the, uh, the output from the previous function as its input. So basically, the intermediate states uh, or the intermediate results from those functions you can, uh, are layers. To also refer to the functions as layers. So basically, in order to learn those parameters, a common algorithm that people use is called uh, backpropagation. The idea of backpropagation is that you're going to start from input data you go through all the layers in the neural network to produce a prediction uh, of the input. And then you compare your prediction with uh, the actual label to get the signals that you can backprop through all the layers to compute gradients or updates for the model parameters. One thing we can observe uh, in this process is that not all the model parameters are used at the same time, and not, op not all the updates are generated at the same time. This gives the opportunity to schedule the communication of the parameters and updates so that we can overlap communication even within a single mini batch. Back like in 2014, like a bunch of students uh, in our lab and, and myself, we worked on porting CAFE onto Boston to do data pilot training uh, for, uh, for deep neural networks. Like one, one trick we had, uh, which we referred to as weight free backpropagation. Uh, was to overlap the backward computation with, um, with network communication. So basically, uh, as I said, like you do, when, you, when you train uh, different networks for each, in, during single, each single mini batch, you first perform a forward pass, then you perform a backward pass. The idea of back uh, with free backpropagation is pretty simple, which basically says once you produce updates for each layer, you immediately send them on the community network such that you can overlap the backpropagation with your, uh, uh, with, your, uh, with your update communication. In the ideal case, you, the computation only has to be idle for the communication of the last layer uh, of your op parameter updates. However, things are not always so I ideal. Uh, in, when your network bandwidth is limited, uh, the communication of uh, your last layer could delay the communication of your first layer. So when we look closely at this process, during the backward process, you're computing parameter updates for, uh, for the top layers first, then you gradually compute parameter updates for the lower layers. However, in the, in the forward pass, you're going to need the parameters for the first layer first, then, then gradually going to need parameters for the later layers. This means if the parameter or updates communication for the later layers takes a long time because of limited network bandwidth, they could delay the communication of the, uh, the updates of the first layer. Uh, so this gives the idea of prioritizing communication based on when the value is needed, which we refer to as, uh, questions? Uh, which we refer to as uh, priority-based parameter prior, um, propagation. So you're gonna, still going to do forward pass and backward pass uh, as before. However, when you generate parameter updates, you're going to do fine-grained communication. For, for example, like in this case, when we generate parameter updates for layer three, we're not going to send all of them at once. We're going to send them like in small, uh, in small chunks. So then like when we generate updates for layer two, we, uh, we're, going to, we're going to stop sending updates for layer three and start sending updates for layer two. So this basically gives the opportunity to doing fine-grained communication, communication 
give us uh, the opportunity Give us, a, give us the opportunity to schedule communication based on the values when the values are needed. Then, like finally, when we get to layer one, we can immediately start communicating parameter updates for layer one. And then, when parameter updates being after parameter updates for layer one is received, the forward com communication can begin. Then we can overlap computing. Then we can overlap computing upper layers with the communication of the rest of the parameter updates. This basically gives us uh, more opportunity to overlap communication with uh, the bin batch computation. So I'm just going to show you a simple experiment on, on how effective this is. So basically, we, we implemented this, this idea in MXNet. MXNet is like one of uh, the deep learning frameworks that people use. Uh, so for data power training, MXNet already implements weight-free backpropagation. So basically, the current curve shows you the vanilla MXNet under uh, the throughput of training res, uh, ResNet 50 using different network bandwidth. So basically, as you can see, uh, so when we increase network bandwidth, ResNet is going to get higher, uh, sorry, MXNet is going to get higher and higher throughput. Now, uh, the, the purple curve, P3, shows you um, the result we get after implement our optimization. So you, what you observe is that like, during, when network bandwidth is limited, for example, like when network bandwidth is only 4 gigabits per second, we see about 30, 40% improvement in the computing throughput. Yes? How did you run this experiment? How did you limit the bandwidth of the network? So basically, uh, we give each node a bandwidth budget. Like basically, we, we throttle the bandwidth on each node. So to uh, throttle to like 4 gigabits per second, 5 gigabits per second. Uh, mm -hmm. There's Linux, uh, I think it's called uh, traffic controller okay. or something. Got it. Right. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yes. So can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So when you send the data for L22, right? Yeah. If that gets delayed, does that mean the forward pass for L2 gets delayed because it doesn't have all the data? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we get delayed. Yes. Okay. So if that happens, then you're going to still have a gap there. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Do you find that in practice, this type of scenario happens? Um, I don't think we specifically measured how much delay we are getting from, like, because L2 is delayed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're primarily, fo primarily focused on, uh, I, I don't think we actually measured how much this kind of delay actually happens, because this would depend on your network architecture as well. It right? depends on your, your model, like, yeah. you know, how, how much time you spend on computing the first layer, mm -hmm. how much time you spend communicating that. So right. I, don't, I don't think we, we have a specific number how much uh, that problem happens. Okay. So yes. By which, with which you split each layer. Uh, so this is actually a, a tuning parameter. I think, uh, I think when we, when we do that, uh, each each chunk has about like tens of thousands of floating point numbers. So, so yeah. So basically, uh, tens or hundreds of kilobytes in each chunk. And does that matter? Does that uh, thing matter at all? I mean, so why can't it reduce it to, like, let's say, the TCP packet sense? So if what we found is that, like, uh, because the software for sending each uh, each message has some overhead, if we send a message that's become too small, uh, the software overhead becomes kind of significant compared to. So basically, we're doing a lot of uh, yeah. compute for sending each packet. So we can we cannot make it too small, uh, but I guess uh, so basically. I think uh, to tens, tens uh, thousands or two hundreds, so two hundred thousand fully important members. Like I think within this range, it's fine. Um, um, yeah. So that's basically. So basically, so far I have talked about improving the computation speed. However, besides computation speed, there's another problem uh, that's important for training large models, which is the memory, right? So, you know, so next, I'm going to show you a project um, that we improved the memory efficiency to allow us to train like 10 times large, larger models on the same hardware. So, so, uh, so did you try it on some of the larger models like BERT and things like that? So or actually, it... like BERT is not the model that has like, you know, a lot of parameters. It has a lot of parameters, but we have we actually tried with models that have even more parameters than, than BERT. Um, so the model like I, I tried uh, called Measure Experts. Uh, this model, uh, like you know, you can change the parameters in that model. Um, so the largest model I can run, like on a single GPU, has about 2.5 billion parameters. BERT has about 100 million parameters. 
so there's some runtime overhead uh, with this approach, which I'll talk about like, during the talk. Okay. You didn't show the graphs for all of those. You only show for less than 50. Uh, uh, so uh, so that, that, was, that was the previous one, right? So, so, I mean, I'm talking about, so you didn't, this, uh, what did you call it? The Ulysses 19 paper yeah. that evaluated on larger models? So that one, uh, so no, that one, that one was not, the Ulysses 19, uh, so this paper, right? This paper was not evaluated on neural net, uh, on, on neural nets. This was like previous sparse models. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. So what about the, uh, so I, this I, one? I'm just confused. Yeah, this one. This one. Uh, mm -hmm. like, let me let me show you the benchmarks we had. Sorry, uh, the SysML19 paper. So this, about this, yeah, oh, this system, paper. Yeah, so this paper, right? This yeah. paper. Uh, we evaluated on on ResNet on. Um, basically, a bunch of like convolutional neural networks, uh, ResNet inception we also uh, evaluated on recurrent neural network. Um, I, I forgot exactly what that one is. Like, uh, I think uh, I forgot. Like, we I mean, said recurrent neural network on, on ResNet. Um, okay. So, uh, the amount of benefit you get from this is depends on how much computation you do per parameter on your model, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, do you have like? Like, how does that range of computation changes for your benchmark? Do you have, like, very high to very low so that you could... So you mean for this one? No, 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 for the previous slide, the, yes, this paper. Yes, so, this technique. So this technique, uh, you mean, like, how much benefit we get it depends on number of parameters um, in one? The of ratio of the computation per parameter of their model, right? Uh, I, I don't have, I don't have that. Okay. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter. Um, so okay, so so to motivate this uh, this problem, uh, first people really need large models to get good performance. So this is a paper like published by Google two years ago. Uh, this paper is about uh, it's called like proposing a new layer called the Mission Experts. So you don't have to know the details of how this layer works. The high level idea you need to know is that basically this allows you to increase the number of parameters in the model by by large factor so that you can get good performance. Uh, so on the x-axis, I'm showing the number of parameters uh, in, in the model. So this application is uh, language modeling. On the y-axis, I'm showing test perplexity. The test perplexity um, basically is lower uh, is better. Uh, means lower uh, the better uh, the better model the, the model is. So as you can see, uh, when you increase uh, the number of parameters in this model, you're going to get better test perplexity or better model quality. However, like the largest model has about like 130 billion parameters. And this requires about 120 GPUs to, to run. So, uh, however, like even though like people desire bigger and bigger models, the GPU memory is highly limited, highly expensive. So here I'm showing you a comparison of with of DRAM price with GPU price in terms of megabytes uh, per dollar. So as you can see over the last uh, uh, over the last 20 years, DRAM price has been decreasing. However, the GPU price is highly expensive compared to DRAM price. So remember, this is log, log scale, right? So, like especially for server server side GPUs, they are like um, almost like three orders more magnitude, uh, more expensive compared to like DRAM price. So not only like GPUs are expensive, um, GPU memory is highly limited. Right? The largest GPU you can get has about 32 gigabytes of DRAM, 32 gigabytes of memory. So, however, this uh, GPU compared to its 16 gigabit, ver gigabit version, it's about $1,400 more expensive. This means you're paying about one, uh, one cent per extra. Uh, so this, this means you're paying about 85 cents. Sorry, uh, sorry, this means you're paying about 8.5 cents per extra megabytes. This also a lot more expensive than you, if you would just buy DRAM. Remember, you're getting this memory without getting any, any extra uh, computation. So motivated by these challenges, so, uh, do yeah. Do you have any intuitions why this, you're seeing this? Why is it that we see such a, so, why is it so expensive for? for so I think there, there are two reasons. Uh, one reason is that uh, when, you, when you design like uh, memory for this, like uh, there's, a, there's a trade off. One is like you want really large memory, you will not be able to sustain a high bandwidth. Or if you want high bandwidth, you, the, the capacity of the memory cannot go really big. So that's an architectural challenge, technical challenge. But also, I think because NVIDIA is dominating this, so 
it basically what it, was, it says, that's the price, right? You can, like, there's no competitor on, on this space. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so basically motivated by this challenge, there has already a lot of work on reducing, uh, on reducing memory cons consumption or uh, making memory more efficient. Uh, so, you know, there are mainly two category techniques. One is called gradient checkpointing, basically trying to leverage recomputation to reduce memory footprint. Um, the other is called memory swapping, basically try to leverage, um, try to leverage chip host memory uh, to reduce memory consumption on GPU. So how, basically the high level idea of gradient checkpointing is based on back propagation process. So uh, during back propagation, you will need the intermediate results from the forward pass to compute the gradients uh, for, the uh, for the model parameters. So what this means is that you, uh, when you reach the, the, the lost layer of your neural network, you have to cache or you have to store the intermediate results from all the previous layers so you can, so you can, you can backprop and compute their gradients. This means if your network has n layers, you have an on memory cost to store all the intermediate results. So the idea of back, uh, gradient checkpointing is basically says, instead of store all the intermediate results, we're gonna store a few checkpoints so that we can recompute um, the, um, the other layers and the results when they are needed. So basically, ideally, uh, if your network has n layers, you can partition the network into n partitions, and, and each, n, each partition has, sorry, not n partitions, square root of n partitions. Each partition has a square root of n nodes, so that you can reduce your memory overhead from uh, n to square root of n. Uh, so another idea is called memory swapping. So the idea is bas uh, says basically, uh, for example, like when you, you're, uh, for each layer, the intermediate results when the updates are generated, uh, they're needed for computing the next layer, but they're also needed during the backward propagation pass. So basically for this long dependencies, instead of caching the value in, in GPU memory, you can temporarily put them onto cheaper host memory and swap them back in before uh, they are used. Uh, so this is, this is called memory swapping. So those ideas, they work pretty well for new neural networks, and uh, that's linear, because linear network gives you, uh, uh, gives you easy, to, uh, make it easier for you to decide which nodes to checkpoint and which node to swap and when to swap them. However, there are more and more neural network architectures that's becoming not linear. Um, so in this case, those techniques will have, uh, will have a hard time to work well. So non-linear, I mean, for example, if you think of, actually that's the next slide I'm talking about. So you have a layer that have a large fan out, have a lot, lot of parallelism, right? So you, you, don't, you don't necessarily compute this like one by one. Uh, right, so this like, this after example is like called mixture experts. Uh, so that, that's what I mentioned earlier. So this is a layer in a neural network. So what happens is in this layer is that there are many parallel experts this number, number experts uh, is a hyperparameter you can tune. Like for example, like you can change this thousands or, or even like hundreds of thousands. And those like when mean batch, uh, when mean batch that comes in, um, different data samples in the mean batch can be handled by different experts. So experts are gonna run in parallel. So this is like a large finite architecture. Uh, it does, um, you don't compute the, the, the experts like one by one. So that's, a, that's an example of a nonlinear uh, non-linear structure. Uh, so, so in this case, right, if you, um, if you com compute all the layers in parallel, you're gonna have a, a large memory overhead. Uh, so, so basically for uh, the goal my, my work is to come up with a memory efficient approach to reduce memory consumption uh, for both linear and non-linear graphs. And we want to implement and evaluate this on mature framework like TensorFlow so that we can, we can evaluate it for different models uh, for across the different uh, large set of benchmarks. And we want to make sure that the, uh, to take advantage uh, of our technique, uh, the, the application does not need to have make any changes. So there has already been a bunch of work to reduce memory consumption uh, for TensorFlow. From this work uh, doing green checkpointing, there's work uh, doing memory swapping. Uh, as I mentioned, they have limitations uh, uh, because they, uh, they typically don't, uh, they're limited to work well for linear graphs. And uh, there's also work uh, 
about like uh, for uh, doing memory swapping for a special operation called while loop. Uh, so of course, like this technique only applies if your model uses this operation while loop. Uh, so um, the first idea in our technique is to trade parallel them uh, uh, for memory consumption. So as I mentioned, um, so as I mentioned, uh, the layers could have a large uh, parallel file. Now, like whole TensorFlow schedules computation for this kind of architecture is basically TensorFlow is doing a breast first traversal of your graph structure. So basically TensorFlow is gonna start from a source node and after the source node finishes computation, TensorFlow will look at all the, uh, all the successors of that node and schedules them, uh, schedules them by putting them in, into a thread pool. So as you can see, now we have four nodes to run in parallel. This gives us, a, gives us a memory consumption of five operations. And then like basically this, this process um, proceed, uh, we're gonna uh, schedule all the operations until the graphs, graphs finish executing. So basically the, the uh, TensorFlow approach by doing uh, breast first traverse of the graph gave us uh, a, a high parallelism. However, uh, this also gave us a high memory consumption. One simple idea to reduce memory consumption during this computation process is that we can linearize the computation graph. Basically, we can sort all the nodes in a topological, topological sorted order and run, run the operations one by one. So the idea is basically we, we find a topological sorted order of all the nodes and run them by one by one, and this gives us a peak um, memory consumption of four operations. Uh, so the, the idea we propose is basically something in the middle. So basically, we, we propose to partition the computation graph into smaller partitions, and we find the political sort order among those partitions. This is the forward pass, or the both forward and back? So path? this is the forward pass, but well, I'm thinking a general computation graph, but you can think of it. I'm thinking a general computation graph, uh, but... Um, so, but in, 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 uh, when you're doing training, you're going to have a backward pass in which you still have to, you still have the same problem of keeping the data around to use in the backward problem. Right, so that, that's true. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, that's true. That's the sec that there's a second idea I'm going to talk about. Okay. So basically, you can, you can still use uh, the, the swapping idea to, to yes. address that problem. Right. Right. So, yes, I uh, agree with you. So, uh, so basically, the, for, for this part, we, we're going we're gonna to be able to explore parallelism within a partition. Uh, then we're going to linearize among partitions uh, uh, to constrain the, uh, the memory consumption. So for the problem that I mentioned, right, so, so for a partition, its result could be used in a nearby, uh, nearby partition, but also could be, using, could be used in a partition that's really far away. So basically, when, when a result is being used in a partition that's really far away, uh, we're going to still swap them out um, to, um, uh, to host memory and swap them in before they are needed uh, to control the memory usage. Because we, we, uh, because we find political sorted order among the partitions, execute partitions one by one, uh, this gives us an easy time to, to decide when to swap uh, things out, when to swap them back in. To give you an idea of uh, the effectiveness of this technique, uh, we draw a transformer model and we use uh, the mixture experts as a fit for layer in that model. And we are able to reduce memory consumption in that model, uh, for that particular model, uh, from 9.5 gigabyte to 6.8 gigabytes. And the last idea we have is particularly for models that have large number of parameters. For example, in the transfer model that, that I just showed you, it has about 800 million parameters. So the idea is that in TensorFlow, if you implement that model, TensorFlow is going to store all the parameters and constants as persistent tensors in GPU memory. So in, uh, in, GP, uh, in GPU memory. So what we propose is that we, we want to store those variables uh, in our host memory and bring them back to GPU memory when they are needed for the computation. Uh, so in TensorFlow, um, for, uh, when, when, you need, when you need tensor value across devices, TensorFlow is basically going to insert a, send, a pair of send receive operation to communicate that tensor value from CPU memory to GPU, uh, to GPU memory. So, in this case, for example, if that variable is going to be needed both in the forward pass and, and in the backward pass. So TensorFlow will only insert one pair send receive to communicate that value from CPU to GPU. 
However, what this means is that when, when, once the GPU receives that, that tensor, GPU has to uh, cache that, uh, that tensor value in GPU memory for a really long time. So however, uh, but basically what we propose is to only basically to insert, um, insert send receive pairs uh, for, uh, for this variable when they are needed. So basically here they are needed in two places, we're gonna insert two send receive pairs to communicate uh, this variable from CPU to GPU. This allows us to reduce the memory consumption for, uh, for models that have lot of parameters, for example, transformer with mixture experts, to reduce that memory consumption from, from 6.8 gigabytes to roughly 3.3 uh, gigabytes. So we implemented this technique in TensorFlow Core. So we made a bunch of TensorFlow Core, and we didn't, there's no change uh, in, the, in the TensorFlow API or Python API. So, so applications can leverage this technique without, with no change in the application code. So we, experimented, we tested this on machines that have one uh, uh, NVIDIA Titan X uh, GPU uh, with 32 virtual cores and 64 uh, gigabytes of uh, uh, CPU memory. So our benchmark consists of five different models. They, have, they use different architectures. For example, we have a transformer which uses attention. We have a transformer that with mixture experts. And we have ResNet, which is a convolutional neural network. We have GANs, we have our, our, like statically on road RNs. Um, and the first model that I want to call your, draw your attention is mixture experts uh, that uh, is transformer with mixture experts, which I've talked about earlier. So basically, uh, on the y-axis, I'm showing you the peak memory consumption of, of the model running on different systems with different optimizations. So the, the, blue, the purple bar shows you the execution on vanilla TensorFlow, and the green bar shows you execution uh, with like, partitioning plus swapping. And the, last, the, per, uh, the blue bar shows you, uh, shows you uh, additionally we have um, execution with uh, variable placement optimization. So as you can see, for, uh, for uh, transformer with mesh experts, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can reduce memory consumption from about 9.5 gigabytes uh, to 3.3 gigabytes for mem peak memory consumption. Uh, so this is a model that have a lot of parameters, about 800 million parameters. Uh, so but for other models, they don't have so many parameters. Uh, so the second largest model, I think, uh, uh, for ResNet, I think has, um, has about 60 million parameters. So next, next result I'm going to draw you to is GANs. For GANs, we achieved the largest memory saving. Uh, we reduced memory consumption from about, eight, uh, from, from about 11 gigabytes uh, to about 1.4 gigabytes is a roughly 87% uh, memory reduction. Uh, on average, we can achieve about uh, we can we can achieve memory consumption about 70 uh, about 70%. So this optimization uh, brings some overheads to runtime uh, because one is we're restricting how much power of them we can use, and second, we incur additional GPU CPU uh, uh, data communication. The largest overhead comes for the model that have a lot of parameters. Uh, so basically the, uh, the box here is the runtime overhead compared to, uh, compared to uh, running on vanilla TensorFlow. So the lot, yes. Sorry, this is, this, is run, uh, this is overhead for like throughput, not like to convergence. Right, so this is overhead in terms of throughput yeah. because our question does not change the semantic of the computation. Exactly. You still get the same result running without that. Um, so this is basically uh, the time to complete one. Yes. So you should finish your talk. Sorry. Finish your talk and then that's it. Okay. Uh, are, are you done with that? Okay. Uh, no, I, I still have a few more talks. <laughs> 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 that particular talk, but okay, so my question was, I, for idea two, which you were showing where you were swapping things up uh -huh. back and forth, Yeah. I think I missed the part. There's something called VDNN from NVIDIA, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it just as similar to that, or is there some delta over there? So uh, it's, it's similar. Uh, the difference is that uh, VDN is the modern neural network architecture. Uh, so I said uh, the modern neural network architecture as a graph, uh, sorry, as a, as a linear architecture, layer by layer. So what the, the part is different is that we partition uh, the neural network. Partitioning part. Right. So because the, generally the graph is not linear, linear, linear sequence of operations. So, so, so. Yeah, is that statement true? Huh? In, you said like in general. 
the graphs that people use to the, for the models that people use today, they're not linear. So, okay, uh, so, okay, uh, I, uh, that's not exactly true. Uh, so, so um, the, the model architecture, a lot of them are linear. For example, if you look at ResNet, there are linear sequence right. of layers. Uh, some of the architecture is not linear, for example, measure experts I mentioned. Right? But if you look at the, the computational graph that, in, that TensorFlow uses, it's not a linear sequence of operations. Right? Because each layer consists of many operations. Right? Those, they, have, they have different find-outs uh, each layer. So if you look at that computational graph, specifically, it's not a linear graph. But if you look at neural network culture the, from the high level, it would be uh, a linear set of uh, operations. I can't vouch for that. For if we looking at, we were looking at the Onyx uh, graph generated for like, you know, one of the models, and you know, it, even though it is like 24 layers, but it was just all bushy and spread out. So one more question. Yeah. So can your algorithm? Let, let me say, like, my GPU has this much budget of your memory. Yeah. Can your algorithm optimize it such that it uses? Uh, uh, that much memory with the maximum amount. Of that's a very good question. That's something I plan to do in the future, but right now we don't have that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about that like towards the end of the talk. Uh, so, um, so that's basically, uh, okay, so I was talking about uh, memory, uh, sorry, the runtime overhead. Uh, so basically uh, for the models that have a lot of parameters, we have about, in the worst case, we have about like 3.4 times runtime overhead. Uh, in the good case, for example, for RNs, uh, we, uh, we starkly unrolled RNs, we have about 30% overhead to achieve about 40% memory uh, saving. So in average, uh, the, the overhead is about 2.2 uh, times. But however, uh, if you exclude the, the highly overhead, like high parameter, um, the, the mixture experts with high number of parameters, of overhead, uh, we can achieve with a five, sorry, with a 55% overhead achieve about 60% of memory reduction. Uh, so one of the direct benefits of this optimization is, optimization is that it allows us to run bigger models. For example, for the mixture experts model that I mentioned earlier, on Manila TensorFlow, uh, you can run like basically four experts per layer. This gives you about 3.24 billion parameters on a single GPU. And if when you use our optimizations, you, you, can, you can scale the number of param parameters per model by like roughly 10 times. Uh, basically, you can run a much larger model. This allows, also allows you to run different models. For example, for ResNet, uh, and, you know, uh, we can scale ResNet up to about almost 2,000 layers. Compared to vanilla TensorFlow, you can run about 500 layers uh, in ResNet. So this also works in the distributed setting. Uh, so uh, so we use a library called TensorTransfer, uh, sorry, uh, Mesh TensorFlow. This gives us a way to like, do model pilot them across different GPUs. So uh, in, uh, by using Mesh TensorFlow across four different machines, TensorFlow allows you to run like mixture experts of, of about 128 experts per layer. Uh, so this, across, this is across four machines with four different GPUs. Uh, so I want to mention that like, the experts I used here uh, each expert uh, is not the same as the expert used here. Basically, this expert is a little bit smaller. Uh, so with TensorFlow, when we scale this to 16 machines, we, can, we don't get a linear, scale, linear scaling in terms of uh, parameters. Basically, when we increase the number of machines by four times, we can only increase the parameter size by almost twice. Uh, so when we use our system, TensorFlow MEM, uh, on the uh, same four machines, we can scale the number of parameters totally to six billion parameters. And after we optimize this mixture experts, uh, sorry, after we optimize the mixture experts, um, we can even we can even increase uh, even more increase number of parameters on these four GPUs. Basically, I'm not going to go into how we optimize mixture expert implementation, but basically the high level idea is we're going to partition the big tensors in that implementation into smaller tensors, so we have more opportunity to do swapping between them. Yes. So how how manual is this from the programmer standpoint? How much, do I get this for free, or do I? So uh, for, for TensorFlow MEM, uh, you're going to get uh, TensorFlow MEM. Basically, you're going to get this for free. Yeah. Uh, for this, you're going to do a little bit better in your application implementation. But I need to express that in, the, in my graph. Yes, yeah, so you need to basically you need, you need to change how you implement your computation graph. Fine. But you get this uh, for free. Great. Um, um, so, so this also allows to run longer sequences for recurring neural network. For example, like compared to vanilla TensorFlow, you uh, you have basically it can scale up to 
uh, 400 uh, lengths, uh, 100 lengths of 400 in your sequence, and we can scale to 800 uh, with some runtime overhead. Uh, so basically, the, the I'm showing you here is time per mini batch. Um, with longer sequences, of course, you're going to run slower. Um, but compared to like vanilla tensile on the same se same sequence length, we have about fifty percent of runtime overhead. So, how much GPU memory was this? Uh, so, the GPU has twelve gigabyte of memory. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, so using the batch size or sequence length. I guess beyond a certain point, you'll see diminishing returns, right, in terms of the compute units being used. So, I guess. Yeah, so I'm not trying to say like you should run really, really long sequences, but just like in case people want to run, this gives sure. you the opportunity sure. to do that. Um, uh, so in summary, I have talked about three major directions. One is you can make better use of network communication by prioritizing communication based, first doing fine network communication, second by prioritizing communication based on relative magnitude and based on when the values are being used. And second, you can, carefully schedule your power computation uh, by, by uh, leveraging the memory access pattern uh, to reduce, con to reduce uh, the inconsistency in parameter states. And lastly, I, you, can, you, can, you can do better scheduling and better placement in your computation graph to reduce, um, to reduce memory consumption of GPU memory by leveraging chip host memory. So looking at the future, machine learning is still fast developing. There are a lot of new models being, being developed. There are a lot of new operations people want to use in machine learning. For example, like the, the recently proposed capsule, right? Uh, so also because the heavy competition in machine learning, people are developing new hardware architectures to accelerate machine learning. Uh, the interest, uh, my interest for research is I want to work, I want to continue to develop uh, new system, software systems for machine learning. What I see is that this kind of software systems is pushing the boundaries of many disciplines in computer science. And um, I want people to, to uh, explore different technologies to improve the state of art for machine learning systems. So the questions that I'm mainly interested in are, first, how can we support expanding set of machine computations? And how can we take advantage of new computer hardware? So there are a couple more concrete directions that I'm particularly interested in. One is programming support and compilation. So how can, we, how can we support new operators, right? For example, Capsule, right? So there's a recent paper, oh, this is not very clear. So there's a recent paper published at Google about comparing how different, like, uh, how different compilers uh, produce kernels. Uh, uh, they're basically comparing the performance of different, uh, different kernels produced by different compilers. So there are like automatic compiler, compilers like uh, plate ML, like tensor comprehension, like for example, play ML, basically here that's like, I think the graph is not very clear, I apologize for that. Uh, this basically is showing you the, the runtime of the kernel. So the, basically uh, the green, sorry, the, the red curve here shows you like carefully can't optimize kernel implementation. And um, the, basically the purple curve shows like play ML, uh, shows you like tensor comprehension, like it's uh, like a green bar here. So basically what we serve, the, the high message I want to show with this, this uh, graph is that there's a high, there's still a, a, a big gap between the automatic compilers compared to manually optimized code. So there's, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement for, um, for generating efficient kernels. And second, it's, uh, can, we can we include, like for example, new primitives in the, for example, comp uh, control flow primitives in the computer graph. For example, functions, right? So if you, your graph might have a lot of repeated patterns or subgraph. For example, like in ResNet, you have this residual block that you repeat many, many times, right? Can you think of like defining those repeated patterns? Like right now, basically people are kind of doing in-place functions, function, right? So can you think of abstracting this as a function uh, in the computer graph, which will simplify program effort, also gives you maybe a more opportunity to optimize the repeated patterns. And lastly, for example, how do we, how do we parallelize competition for newer hardware? Also another direction I'm interested in is model parallelism. Basically, how do we partition, model parallelism I think involves two problems. How do we partition operations and how do we place uh, fine-grained operations onto distributed devices? And there's, I think one particular direction that's interesting is think about dynamically placing operators on devices for dynamically changing comp 
uh, graph topologies. For example, when the graph involves dynamic control flow, you, the graph topology is not statically determined. Uh, there might be opportunity for dyna dynamically placing operations on the devices to improve the computation efficiency. And because all of those directions involve uh, complex uh, design spaces, um, there, uh, maybe we should leverage new techniques, for example, machine learning to explore a complex design space to find good, uh, to find, for example, good uh, device placement for, uh, for efficiency. So a, a more concrete example I want to talk about is, uh, you know, in the near future, that could be uh, an interesting direction, is to achieve efficient memory, com uh, efficient, memory efficient deep learning uh, with high computation throughput. And, you know, the, the direction so you mentioned is like, suppose we have, um, suppose we have uh, memory constraint, how do we, how do we maximize uh, computation throughput with the, within, the, within the memory constraint we have? So right now there are, there, are many, there are many techniques to reduce memory consumption for deep learning, right? So there's scheduling, which I talked about, about treating degree parallelism with memory consumption. Um, there's techniques like gradient checkpointing, uh, treating competition for uh, memory consumption, like there's memory swapping. Uh, there's also like quantization, which treats accuracy uh, for memory consumption, right? So it's hard to determine what kind of techniques you want to apply. Also for each of this technique, um, there are many high parameters you want to tune. Like for example, regarding scheduling, right? It's it's an hard problem. It's an complete problem to find the scheduling um, that mini minimizes its, uh, its memory consumption, right? Uh, and second, the best configuration of those uh, of those techniques would depend on your particular model architecture and your hardware. And lastly, those techniques are interdependent, interdependent which means like the order uh, you apply those techniques would also matter. Right, so in what, you, what all you should uh, apply them. So basically, a, a good question I think to ask is, how can we minimize training time or achieve a good model quality subject to certain memory constraint? With that, I want to conclude my talk. I, uh, I think, uh, with that, I want to conclude my talk. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Time for like probably one question. We have a lot of questions to yeah. <laughs> Cool. We all answered. I think we all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.